seaward, the waves are breaking over the crest of the reef, which runs parallel to the coast. Huge buttresses of coral slope down and take the force of the sea. Towards land, the water is calm and shallow with white sand flats. Nearer the shore, marine grasses root in the sandy bottom. Where the water meets the land, mangrove trees can grow. Further inland, there's a tidal pool. In all these places, the water is warm and clear, with few of the minute drifting plants that would otherwise make the water murky. Nearly a thousand kinds of animal dwell below in a living city. Sustained by the sea and the sun, the coral reef is its heart. The city dwellers feed and sleep in shifts. The nocturnal creatures are resting, hidden in the holes and crevices of the reef. The daytime crowd are busy. Some hunt for food in the reef, others search in the sand and coral rubble behind it. Many fish forage in the marine grass beds beyond the reef city. These vast green suburbs harbour plenty of food and danger. Baby fish shoal in the tidal pool. In the struggle to survive and reproduce, many strange habits have evolved and each resident is armed for attack or defence. Longer than a man, the great barracuda is the largest predator here. It stalks for fish at dawn and dusk, a grey shadow in grey water. The moray eel has powerful jaws and a vice-like grip. It hunts at night and will even prize sleeping fish from their crevices. During the day, it lurks in its cave, lunging out to snatch a bite should it smell a passerby. When compared with the big predators, these yellow-tailed snappers look fairly harmless but they hunt in groups and have voracious appetites. Their deeply forked tails give them great agility and swimming speed, enabling them to snap up quite small, quick prey. Dwarf herring travel in schools, finding safety in numbers. Swimming alone, each one would be at risk. Schooling and being silvery blue makes them only a phantom target for even the most agile predator. Blue tangs are larger and less vulnerable. Each one is armed with a flick knife, a sharp retractable spine that can wound severely. But even they school for protection with the barracuda in sight. Schooling also intimidates other fish in whose territories the tangs pass. In the fight for survival, the prey have evolved many devices and disguises for escape and defence. This spiny blenny is the size of your thumbnail. It survives by living in a hole will leave only to settle territorial disputes.
It feeds by sticking its head out, snatching at nearby plankton. It's risky. By keeping alert, it keeps its head. Some creatures avoid becoming a tasty morsel by digging a burrow in the sand at the base of the reef. The mantis shrimp is a specialist in excavation. It has ten legs for digging and eight basket-like arms for carrying, so it's quickly concealed. Reef fish often use colour and pattern as camouflage to confuse their enemies. These so-called four-eyed butterfly fish hide their real eyes with a vertical stripe. They have false eye spots on the base of their tails, where a bite from a predator wouldn't do much harm. The grey angelfish looms large in silhouette, but when viewed tail or head-on, it becomes less of a target a slim streak. The deep, compressed body gives manoeuvrability and these fish can turn quickly, which baffles predators. The bold pattern on these young Atlantic spade fish breaks up their outline and serves as camouflage. When fully grown, they lose their stripes, but by then only the barracuda could harm them. Colour can be used to advertise and at the same time to protect. Juvenile angelfish pluck parasites from the skin and gills of larger fish. These turn up and queue for attention. Clients like this blue-striped grunt recognize a cleaner's costume and restrain their instinct to eat it. The cleaning business benefits both the cleaner and the client. The cleaner gets a meal and the client gets rid of the parasites that could kill it. Blue chromis and creoles are disinfested by juvenile wrasse. Cleaning is a daily business, for the sea is full of microscopic spores and larvae, many of them parasites seeking a place to settle. Amazingly, this immense construction, the coral reef itself, resulted from the chance settlement of free-swimming coral larvae. The Caribbean Sea rose to its present level 5,000 years ago, submerging the ancient reefs. New reefs have been developing ever since. The living coral is a veneer growing a few inches a year on top of old skeletons. To reproduce, the tiny coral animals release sperm and eggs into the sea at night. A fertilized egg develops to form a larva, or planula. Large numbers of planulae are produced, but many are eaten by fish. Tiny hairs surround a planula and propel it through the water and it grows as it swims. Many different surfaces will be tested before it settles to start a new colony. Still smaller than a pinhead, it's two weeks old when it finally comes to rest. The undersurface spreads to form a disk while the upper surface pushes inwards to form a mouth and gut. Whilst it grows, the coral animal does something quite remarkable. It takes in lodgers, tiny living plants. Yellow-brown algae, the dark spots. With the aid of sunlight, these plants produce an excess of oxygen, sugar and essential nutrients which are shared with the coral. 
In return, the plant cells take the coral's waste products, the carbon dioxide and nitrogen the plants need to function. It's a recycling process from which both benefit. This first individual, or coral polyp, has formed a central mouth and around it stinging tentacles appear. It now starts to secrete a skeletal framework so that it sits in a cup. Non-sexual division or cloning now begins. Perfect replicas bud off from the sides of the first coral polyp but remain linked to the parent. As each one grows, it forms its own compartment. Then it too sends out buds. At an ever-increasing rate, a honeycomb of calcium carbonate rock is built up, giving shelter to each polyp and structure to the colony. Over the years, these compartments accumulate into vast reefs coated with a living layer of coral colonies. Each polyp is a pinhead-sized predator with finger-like stinging tentacles ready to touch and paralyze minute larvae or fish and draw it into the central mouth. Because the polyps are still connected internally, digested food can be shared. The coral polyps extend their tentacles to feed at night. During the day, they are nourished by their plant lodgers. Not all corals produce rock. Sea fans are flexible coral colonies that look like plants. They have a main stem attached to the seabed, but like this delicate sea feather, they're still made up of thousands of individual animal polyps and reproduce in the same way as hard reef builders like brain coral and pillar coral. The greatest growth of corals is in the sunlit aerated waters near the surface, the height of the colony being limited by exposure to the air and surf. With the aid of its plant lodgers, the algae, these elkhorn corals can grow several centimetres a year. Each colony is taller than a man and about a hundred years old. Different corals live at different depths. Below the Elkhorn is a reef terrace. Sloping seaward, slow-growing mound corals form buttresses that alternate with sandy channels. These break the force of the waves and allow fine sediment which could choke the coral to flow away to deep water. The channel leads to the steep wall that falls straight down to deep water. Twenty-five metres down, and along the drop-off wall there's a dense growth of sponges, sea fans, and slender whip coral. Thirty metres down, and only in the Caribbean do corals grow at such depth. They spread wide plates to gather enough light to survive. Deeper still, the mouth of a cave that will lead upwards to the reef terrace. Caves and fissures honeycomb this colossal edifice. It's made of coral limestone, fused with a cement made by seaweeds and forged by the force of the waves. This must surely be the most extraordinary built-up area in the world. Back on the reef terrace in 15 metres of water and it all looks so peaceful. Over 65 species of coral live here company of minute master builders constructing an enormous reef. Charles Darwin described them as delicate coral animals that conquer the great mechanical power of the sea. Yet these delicate animals are extremely aggressive. They battle to build. 
the struggle revealed by compressing 48 hours into half a minute. When species fight, each polyp throws out white threads from its gut to kill and eat the polyps of its neighbours. The slow-growing brain coral on the left, behind the little mushroom coral, senses that the star coral on the right has grown too close. The white threads are from the brain coral on the left. The coral on the right is losing the battle and is not counter-attacking. These battles are for living space. There's a coral pecking order. Each kind will only attack a less aggressive coral. But how they identify each other is still a mystery. As the polyps are killed, so their tissues are sucked up by the victors. So the winners gain sustenance as well as space. By the end of 48 hours, the gut threads have devoured the living tissues of an intruder. Bare rock skeletons are the evidence of such battles. Corals may wage this slow warfare on each other, but they are all exposed to other hazards. Silt can smother them, plants grow on them, and other animals encrust them, bore into them, and eat them. Seaweeds grow rapidly and the entire reef city would be overgrown, choked to death but for these herbivores, the vegetarians of the reef. They graze the marine turf and keep it cropped. With poor digestive systems they must eat non-stop throughout the day to survive. So the corals benefit. Parrotfish, on the other hand, are crude feeders. They crunch and eat living coral. Their massive teeth are fused into a parrot-like beak. White scars show where they've had a meal. Using special teeth in their throats, they grind and powder the rock, live polyps and algae. The waste matter they excrete is fine coral sand. This wafts down and through the reef and over the years it settles to provide homes for many burrowing creatures. Like tropical birds, parrotfish come in rainbow colours. The red ones are female. This living pincushion can also damage coral. It's a long-spined sea urchin and it hides in the reef by day. Although formidably armed with poisonous bristles, it has soft underparts and vulnerable tube feet that predators find tasty. In the centre of its colourful underbelly are the five chisel-like teeth used for scraping and shredding mouthfuls of seaweed and for gouging the coral. The ruffled slug is a snail without a shell and it sups on seaweed juice. Like coral, it has its own built-in solar energy collectors. But unlike coral, it doesn't take in and shelter whole plants. When young, it strips out a plant's tiny stores of the green pigment chlorophyll, crucial for food making, and transfers them to its leaf-like gills where they provide extra energy for the slug. With this internal food source, the delicate and beautiful slug spends most of its time sunbathing in the shallows. It's protected from predators by its nasty taste. In this part of the reef, the coral is dead. It's covered by a luxuriant crop of seaweed, tended by fish. The fish are farmers, and their extraordinary behaviour has only recently been discovered. Instead of grazing haphazardly around the reef, keeping the living coral heads free of algae, the three-spot damselfish systematically kill patches of coral tissue, which encourages the rampant plant growth. 
Throughout the reef, there are many such farms, which are maintained and guarded by the seaweed farmers. As the crops grow and thicken, they attract minute shrimps, which become rich protein for the browsing fish. Each farmer has a sizeable pasture which it constantly patrols, driving out and chasing away intruders, including much larger fish and even human divers. Some slow-moving trespassers that are tempted in by the lush growth can't beat a hasty retreat. They receive severe punishment. This sea urchin is losing its spines. The aggressive damselfish is undaunted by its sharp needles and bites them off one by one. Not all thieves are here for the seaweed. Cleaner fish have a taste for eggs. The yellow-tailed damsel has laid hers down in the coral. She loses a few in the first skirmish, but remains on guard. Unable to clean up the eggs, the cleaners will soon get back to their other business. Where the city of Coral ends, the vast suburb of sand begins. It's a dangerous place, and most of the community conceal themselves underground. But the hunters that come from the reef are well equipped. Goatfish possess a pair of probing barbels below the chin for sensing and flushing out prey. Wherever the goatfish comb the sand, the scavengers will follow. In a flurry of legs and pincers, a crab hurries to hide. There's a large porcupine fish approaching, and the crab's armour could be crushed and cracked by its powerful jaws. Some creatures dig into the bottom, others live by resembling it. The flounder is flat and has both eyes on its upper side. Moving over seaweed or rubble, it alters colour accordingly. Its eyes register the patterns of the bottom, and pigment cells in its skin automatically reproduce the colour match. The sand is crowded with well-camouflaged creatures that watch and wait. The curious Lancer Dragonette is a thumb-sized mimic. It darts from hiding to catch plankton and then flashes a brilliant dorsal fin. It's a bluff. It's only pretending that it has poisonous spines and that saves it from predators. Shrouded in sand, the lizardfish keeps an eye out for prey. A sudden surprise attack usually guarantees a meal. Motionless for hours, it rockets upwards and misses. It must now settle in for another long wait. Almost invisible amongst the coral rubble, the scorpion fish is the model for the mimics. Protected by spines that can wound and inject poison, predators learn to keep away. But even scorpion fish have a few things to learn. The baby puffer fish may look vulnerable, but it has its own defensive weapons. When this large mouth opens and a miniature current sucks the baby inside, something very strange will happen.
the scorpion fish is still puzzling it out and has to try again. In slow motion, the scorpion fish captures the puffer, which inflates like a balloon to become a painful mouthful which is then spat out. When it inflates, it erects sharp spikes, like the ones on this closely related but much bigger porcupine fish. There are circumstances where even these weapons fail. A large shark would swallow this football-sized porcupine, spikes and all. The hermit crab is safe enough as it sifts sand for food. Its tough head and front legs are armour-plated and it protects its soft abdomen and unplated rear parts by living in an empty shell. When it begins to outgrow a shell, it finds a replacement. It may inspect several before deciding to move in. This is the dangerous part, scuttling from one shell to another. The cowfish has little to fear. Its body is protected by rigid bony plates formed by calcified scales. Armed with eye and tail spikes, it's an impossible mouthful. If attacked, it will also produce poison from its lip glands. From almost rigid jaws, the cowfish squirts a powerful jet of water into the sand, which uncovers worms and other prey. It spends its days feeding on the sand flats, returning to the reef to sleep. rippling sea cucumber resides on the flats. Well camouflaged, it earns its keep by vacuuming the suburbs. Using its sticky tentacles, it shovels sand into its central mouth, digesting out the plants and animals. The sand is processed in this way by many creatures, which keeps it white and clean. Beyond the sand flats, towards the shore, dense pastures of sea grass grow and harbour yet another curious community. At night, shoals of fish come to the reef to feed on the grass and on the residents. But the animals that live here are experts in camouflage, like this finger-sized green wrasse. And a well-concealed blenny. Mollusks and crustaceans hide in the sand and under the grass. The Caribbean lobster has especially slim pincers for winkling them out. It hasn't noticed the small snail approaching, confidently carrying its little protective shell that would be useless against the lobster's claws. There are scorpion fish here too covered with scales and bumps that resemble their grassy hiding place. Like its cousin on the sand flats, it too has venomous spines and ambushes its victims.
Even well-protected creatures hide themselves. There are sleeping sea urchins here, their short, stout spines covered with blades of grass. Safe and snug, they have strange bedfellows, for between the urchin's bristles, a tiny shrimp makes its home. Clinging to the spines, the shrimp takes on their colour and shape. Using its minute claws, it feeds from the debris that gets caught in the spines. It'll spend its life here by courtesy of the black and white sea urchin, which apparently gains nothing from the association. The shrimp has a compound eye made up of many tiny visual units. The more units a creature has, the better it sees. Sea urchins come in many colours, and they all house a matching shrimp. The conch snail is well protected by its shell and can grow to the size of a dinner plate if not preyed upon by man. For many people, conch flesh is a delicacy and the shell prized as a musical instrument. A conch has well-developed eyes which are born on long, movable eye stalks. The mouth is at the end of the trunk-like proboscis and with its rasping tongue, it removes seaweed and other organisms from the blades of grass. The separately controlled eye stalks can be pointed forward for binocular vision. During the day, a small goby, the cardinal fish, shares the security of the snail's home. Tonight it will leave its shelter to search for food. Should this conch move away, it'll find another. Once under the mantle, the goby guards its new territory. Where the seagrass meets land, mangrove trees grow, preventing erosion of the coastline and providing another niche for creatures to fill. Mangroves are distinctive, propped on tangles of stilt roots. Some mangroves absorb seawater, purify it internally and excrete the salt through pores in their leaves. The roots of the red mangrove remove the salt before the water is absorbed. These long underwater roots are host to colonies of mussels and to a strange jellyfish called Cassiopeia. Pulsations of the mushroom-shaped bell propel the jellyfish through the water. Like coral, it too has taken in energy-producing plant lodges housing them in its eight branching tentacles. Most of the day is spent sunbathing. It lies on the bottom, tentacles towards the light, being fed by the plants within. But its tentacles have not lost their stinging cells, and should the need arise, the jellyfish can turn predator and capture other plankton. These tidal waters play a vital part in the complex life of the reef. They are the nursery grounds. Enormous numbers of baby fish find shelter and food in and around the mangrove roots. At this stage, baby barracuda rub scales with baby wrasse.
Outside the city limits, where the shore is not protected by the coral reef, it's a different story. With no natural barrier, the sea erodes the land. In this harsh environment, only a few hardy species survive. The urchins that cling to these rocks are only a quarter the size of their cousins in the grass beds. Just a centimetre in diameter, they provide shelter for even smaller fish. Protected from the rough seas and from predators, the nine-lined goby lives under the urchin. An ungrateful guest, it nibbles and eats the urchin's tube feet. To resist the waves, the tough little urchin chisels at the rock to make a burrow. There are often two gobies in residence under one urchin, but the green-banded goby has better manners and refrains from nibbling its host's feet. Life here is sparse. It's the reef that pulses with a diverse abundance of life by day and by night. Minutes before sunset, and the daytime residents will soon be making for shelter. Sea urchins are already on the nightly move. They migrate down from the safety of the reef to feed in the grass beds. At 500 times faster than normal, their movements are revealed by time-lapse photography. They're slow commuters, shuffling along on their long spines and little tube feet. Passing fish are mere flickers of light. The migration continues well into the night. Schools of grunt and squirrel fish are now awake. The grunts also go to feed in the grass beds. Tomorrow, as they sleep, they will excrete rich nutrients over the corals, a benefit from this journey. The squirrel fish has large eyes and sees well at night. A hunter, it's sensitive to vibration, pressure and smell. At night, the transparent plankton leaves the reef where the coral polyps are feeding and rises upwards. It's a lively mix. Larvae, worms, snails, jellyfish and shrimps. Countless millions of these small animals feed on drifting microscopic plants or on each other. This tiny jellyfish shows its stomach to the world. Its tentacles are armed with stinging cells to paralyze the prey before pushing it into the mouth to be visibly digested. It captures a minute crab larva. But somehow the crab escapes. Enormous numbers are caught and eaten, but enough molt into perfect little crabs to ensure their overall survival. This magical creature shines in the dark. It moves through the water, propelled by fine rippling hairs. It's a delicate, comb jelly in pursuit of other plankton.
Under cover of darkness, the coral polyps extend and wave their tentacles, waiting for the currents to bring the plankton within their grasp. The city at night is beautiful, but there's danger everywhere. The day-feeding parrotfish are fast asleep in their usual crevices. Many fish, such as the tangs, butterflies, angels, and other herbivores are snug in safer spots deep within the reef. The few fish about are carnivores. The blood-red cardinal fish has faded to grey and pursues the plankton. The subtly camouflaged trunk fish doesn't keep regular hours when hungry. It's off to churn up a late supper in the sand. The urchins that feed by day are again undercover. The porcupine fish is often abroad at night. At the first sight of danger, it'll inflate and erect its thorny spines. The spotted moray eel slithers snake-like from its cave to stalk for prey in the grass. It can detect and follow traces of chemical scent. The solitary octopus siphons itself into alien shapes. It drapes the coral, feeling with meter-long sucker-lined tentacles for the sleeping fish. Perfectly camouflaged, it can change colour in seconds. feels and observes the rocks, so it changes to mimic their colour and texture. This tropical architecture shelters a thriving community. Citizens that live in a maze of crevices and caves, hideaways and sleeping places. They cooperate or compete with or consume each other. Some stalk and ambush. Others graze a peaceful living. And all the while, the minute builders are at work. With just plankton, and sunlight, they create their vast constructions, these cities of coral.